focus on your end. Welcome back to GA Fan TV. My name is Aaron. I'm delighted to be joined here by Shay Brady of the Play on GA podcast to run through the weekend's football action and certainly a lot of talking points, a lot of discussion points to uh, to run through this weekend. We obviously had Derry's huge win over Donegal, their first Ulster title in 24 years. We had, I suppose, predictable provincial wins for both Kerry and Dublin in in many respects. Maybe Dublin's victory was a lot more emphatic than people expected. And obviously Galway grinding out a three-point win against Ross Common in uh, what was a fairly entertaining game, to be fair. So we are brought to you by Declan Kirby, GA Star, the best children's GA book out there in the market at the minute. You can check it out uh, on Easton's, Amazon, all good bookshops. Uh, it's in the description down below. Great supporters of the channel, so if you can check them out. Be much appreciated. Um, Shay, how's things with yourself? Yeah, good, Aaron. Thanks for having me on again. Um, yeah, no, I've been been working away lately. Yeah, the the GA this weekend was very interesting. Some some good games, some good atmospheres, but uh, yeah, as you said yourself, some predictable results. But then on the flip side, I mean, the contrast of Kerry and Dublin's kind of predictable victories, and then the the outburst of emotion from the Derry Donegal game, and the, you know the twenty four years, the gap that they bridged there, and the history that they made, and. I think one thing that's not being talked about is where Derry were um, only five years ago. Like, get what relegated to Division Four. Like, so many players had deserted the camp. It was similar to the situation that Down actually kind of find themselves in now, where it almost looked like a bit of a joke. A lot of players were were preferring playing for their club over the county, and now look at them like they're all, they're also champions. And in my opinion, real, real All Ireland contenders now because. Like to beat Tyrone, to beat Donegal, and to beat Monaghan. If that was any other team, like if Armagh had done that, for example, we'd be talking Armagh up as All Ireland contenders. So Derry are right up there for me. Yeah, hundred percent. I mean, there's no they did it the hard way. Like they beat the three best teams in Ulster. Like they beat Donegal, they beat Monaghan, they beat Tyrone, who were All Ireland champions as well. Like I mean, if Tyrone had to come through Ulster, beating Donegal and Monaghan along the way and beating Derry. I think everyone would probably have Tyrone as the, as the all Ireland favourites. Now, fair enough, they won the all Ireland last year, so they have a bit of credibility in the bank. And obviously, we, Derry haven't played in Crow Park, I think, since the Division 4 final against Leitrim. That's another story as well, like you said there. Like, I mean, back there were Division 4 back in 2019, and they were just, you know, all over the place, really, after, I think, three consecutive relegations uh, that found themselves in Division 4. So... As you said, an incredible rise, incredible journey. And it's great to see, like, it's great to see new teams coming along in, in Gaelic football. And that's why I said yesterday's win was like a win for Gaelic football because, like, obviously, it's quite funny coming from two Dublin fans saying we need new teams coming along in Gaelic football. But at the same time, to see teams like a Derry come along, like, it, it's just, it is just a breath of fresh air in many ways. No, oh, 100%. 100%. Because the, the worst thing was is that say for us as Dublin fans is that do you remember that those few years now where Westmead made the Leinster final and it just felt like Groundhog Day they turned up took the beating and went home um you love this feeling of a new team coming and speaking personally as a Dublin fan I would love nothing more than Mead to really come good maybe not to necessarily take over but to be a real rival to us because like you know listening to listening to me Elfel, and listening to a lot of older Dublin fans, they'll talk a lot about the 90s games and that rivalry that you had in Leinster. And there were genuine All-Ireland contenders in Leinster as well as Dublin. And that put a real great start to the, the championship in the summer. Dublin's doesn't kick off till the semi-final stage, really, over the last 10 years. So, look, I'd love more teams to come good. I'd love more teams to look at what Derry have done and look at, look, 
you can get players to buy in. Like Meads, for example, are the interesting one that we've looked at. How many Meads lads are not in the panel? That that probably could be. I mean, you're talking the likes of Keane McBride that went to play over in Australia. Connor Nash is another one that's over there. Like, could they be a Connor Glass type, type player to come back and go into the midfield and really transform the team? Because, like, what they've shown is that, look, once you get a bit of momentum behind you, a lot of players will buy in very quickly. And then who knows where that can take you? And me definitely have right up there with the history that Derry have and the passion for football. So I think a lot of teams should really take a leaf out of Derry's book on this one. Yeah, I think so. I agree as well. I think I think a lot of counties really should look at look at Derry's story. And, and sometimes there can be this thing in the GEA where people love to point the blame at other counties and, oh, well, they have too much here. They have too much going on there. And obviously, a lot of the time there are unfair advantages and, and certainly Dublin probably do have a lot of them. But I do think at the same time, you know, you should be looking at counties like Derry who were way down in the doldrums a couple of years ago and all of a sudden now they found themselves as also champions and, and potentially in with a shout of, a, of an All-Ireland. And I suppose in terms of the game itself, I mean, it was Derry 116, Donegal 114. I mean, what was your thoughts overall on the game? Because, like, definitely some mixed reaction. I mean, a lot of people saying it was a very poor game, the quality was poor, uh, all the rest. You call more work, obviously, um, you know, I suppose going a bit crazy. On uh, on commentary for RT, but what were your your thoughts on the on the spectacle in general? Yeah, I thought it was very unique. Um, I thought the way that both teams mirrored each other and hung on to the ball for such a long period of time. I mean, ten minutes with no score right at the start. I mean, that says it all. Derry in their previous games had come flying out of the traps, particularly in the Monaghan game, the Garrett McKinless goal, pretty much straight away. But so ten minutes without a score really showed how cagey both sides were. I think Donegal, they, I don't know if showing them too much respect is a, an accurate thing to say, but they definitely changed how they played to go against Derry here. They mirrored them a lot. Um, I thought Derry's defence, again, was excellent. We knew that it would be. They've taken a real similar approach to how Jim McGuinness kind of Donegal side played that, as in their trump card, is they make other teams play their game. And I feel like Donegal saw how Tyrone and Monaghan kind of fell into the trap of the Derry defence. And they were saying, well, that's not going to happen to us. And if you look at how close Donegal did get to beating Derry, you could argue that they probably went about it the right way. But they, I think Donegal, instead of looking at, you know, how can we get closer to them, they probably should have taken a leaf out of Ross Common's book, who drew with them, taken a leaf out of Galway's book, who blew Derry away in the league campaign. I think Donegal... They didn't go for the juggler at all. They literally took no risks. They were they looked like they were, look, let's just get a one-point victory, hopefully here. Hopefully Michael Murphy can pull it out of the bag and let's hope that we can get out of here. Because, I mean, it worked for them last year. Paddy McBrady hit that wonder point at the end and they got out with a one-point victory. But yeah, neither side was willing to take a risk um, throughout the entire game. So it made for a very, very kind of, if boring at times in terms of you're talking about the quality of play but then on the flip side the atmosphere at the end particularly at the end of extra time with those two late points from brendan rogers and connor glass i mean the stadium sounded like it was about to take off like the absolute atmosphere the passion you could hear it, it was a type of roar that you very rarely hear from the crowd you could tell how much it meant to them and they won't care how they won this game they won't care they've done it they've won um but I do think that that style, I'm not sure. I think Derry might have to take a bit more of a risk to beat the likes of a Dublin and a Kerry later on. Yeah, absolutely. Rory says here, great to see Derry win something big. Rory Gallagher has taken this team to a new level, and I definitely have them in the in the conversation for an All Ireland. And he also says, I almost fell asleep watching Donegal passing around from from side to side and yeah well it was it was an interesting tactic from Donegal as you as you said before and they're a strange team at times because they clearly do have lots of quality in their team they clearly are a top team and I mean Michael Murphy's an incredible footballer been that for the last 10 plus years Paddy McBrady expert finisher Michael Langan very good on the ball the O'Donnells who've come in look very good Sean Patton very good goalkeeper but for whatever reason they just can't seem to get it right in these big, big games, like when there's pressure on, big, big pressure on, they just, under Declan Bonner in particular, they just haven't quite been able to deliver. Like you think of this defeat 
You think of Cavan a couple of years ago, Tyrone last year. I mean, the list goes on. Mayo even the year before in the Super 8s. The, whatever, for whatever reason, in big, big moments and big games, they just haven't quite been able to get over the line. Yeah, and I don't know what that is because, I mean, Jim McGuinness made them psychologically the toughest team in the country. I mean, there was nothing that could break that Donegal side. Um, they, yeah, they do. They It seems like they don't necessarily believe in themselves as much. Like, you could tell that they were loving to have another crack at Tyrone after Tyrone won the All-Ireland. But Tyrone had more of a belief about themselves that they could go on and win the All-Ireland. I mean... Donegal got to the final in 2014 and they haven't been there since. And every year they have had the players, in my opinion, to win in all out. They absolutely do. If Tyrone could do it, Donegal can do it. If we're talking about Derry, that they can potentially win the all out, then Donegal can. You're saying Kerry out of favourites. Donegal played one of the best games of Gaelic football I've ever seen against them in the Super 8 a couple of years ago. I think it was 2019 where it finished mm. a draw. And that was an epic game of Gaelic football. They absolutely have the players. And you, you haven't even mentioned the likes of Jamie Brennan, Ryan McHugh, Kieran Thompson. Like, they, they're flooded with talent. So to see them kind of go down in a way where th they'd be walking away thinking, we didn't even really have a go there. We didn't go for the jugular at any point. Mike, the, this, uh, sorry, the goal mouth scramble at the end with Michael Murphy's free. That was the only real time that they seemed to just throw it at, <laughs> throw it all at Derry, and they nearly got a goal out of it. So you'd be thinking, why did you just wait until like literally the last kick of the game to suddenly throw everyone up front? And you nearly caught Derry out. Derry are a Division Two team. I know that they've beaten, you know, Tyrone and they've beaten Monaghan, but they didn't get out of Division Two. Like they they failed to beat Roscommon and they drew and they lost to Galway. So. Donegal, I think, should have walked into this game with a little bit more confidence than they did as the Division One team, as a side that have won how many Ulster titles in the last five years. But it does seem like they've just got a bit of a mental block there where Michael Murphy now really is the only one, Paddy McBrady too, from that iron mind Jim McGuinness side back in 2012. So I think this side, psychologically, I think that's their, that's their kryptonite, if you like. They, they can't... So they don't believe that they can win when it really comes down to it. Yeah, it's a, it is an interesting one, all right. And like I felt like at the start of the second half, they they gave it a bit of a goal. Like they got that early goal, and it looked like they were going to kick on. And and, and you seen when they started running at Derry, like they did start causing a, a couple of issues. But then for whatever reason, like once they got the lead, they seemed to retract again. And when they built up a two point lead, they were retracting far too much into their shell, and they just they just didn't want to seem to take that risk or that chance. Whereas Derry on the other hand side were were clearly probably more of the aggressors, even though they probably had less of the of the ball throughout the game. But speaking and that of that was it, Aaron. That was it. That was it. That was that moment where I think it was yes, it was the 43rd minute. Shane O'Donnell got that point to put them one nine to one seven up. The game's in their mm -hmm. hands there. Now Derry have to come to them. Now Derry have to. Like the key with that defensive system is to get in front. That's the key with that defensive system because then you can allow the other team to kind of come to you more. Donegal had the lead and just gave it away. If you get a Kerry and a Dublin there, especially a Dublin under Jim Gavin, they win that game because they know how to manage it. They know how to play the game out. Now we know that your plan A has gone up in smoke because now we have the lead with 17 minutes left to go. Oh, sorry, 27 minutes left to go. So mm. I think Donegal should have close the game out from there when they were in front because let's not forget as well they kept going back in front Derry kept you know clawing them back Michael Murphy's point put them 111 to 110 up then they were 112 to 111 up like so look and as well as that at the end they're they're they put themselves in a lot of trouble I don't know how uh Stephen McMenamin didn't get a black card right at the end of the game that that kick out from Patton to McMenamin and then Shane McGuigan got there before McMenamin pulled him down like mm. you can't change my mind about that he pulled him down and how they got away with that they just played themselves into trouble and yeah so my point is they just they really should have closed that game out yeah and like well, what's interesting as well is like Emma Bradley's points like just after just after extra time I think around the 74th or 75th minute it was the first time Derry went in front since early on in the in, in the second half just up until Donegal's early goals. So I suppose like Donegal really did have more control in the game than, than Derry at large parts. And you think 
with the experience that they'd have that they'd be able to, to go ahead and see it out. But look, from a dairy perspective, you have to give them credit, though, because as we said, they've beaten Tyrone, they've beaten Monaghan, they've now beaten Donegal. You know, there was something I was saying to John McMahon yesterday during the, the watch along stream, which was Derry have never been in this position before. Like they don't have that experience. They don't have those, like that mental sort of fortitude. Like you think of Dublin when they've got through a lot of those big moments and big games in 2019, 20, 2020, 2018, like a lot of those sort of big crunch games with Mayo and, and all the rest. Like a lot of the time, it was just the mentality really that I think that, that, that saw them through. It was the experience of having done it before. It was the confidence of having done it before. Derry didn't have that, and yet they still came through. They still managed to oversee that adversity, and that's what leads me to believe that, especially with a coach like Rory Gallagher, like they have to be considered as for me. Like Dublin and Kerry are probably one and two, whatever order you want to have them in. But in terms of who's number three, I think Derry definitely have a big shout of being that team. Yeah, definitely because you were talking there about Dublin. Um, having that calmness and that confidence in a final to say, look, we know how to do this. We're going to stay calm no matter what's happening and we'll get the result. Mayo have the complete other side. Like if Derry and Mayo were to play each other in a final, like who has the mental advantage here? Like Derry have the mental advantage here because Mayo get into a position where they're in a really good uh, position to win the game. I mean, you think of Lee Keegan's goals back to back in 2016 and 2017, both times that he scored those goals. I remember watching being like, they have to win now. And they somehow found a way to lose. Derry found a way to win on the weekend. They found a way. They just kept going. They never gave up. And especially when you look at that full time, they should have won that game. When you when you go into it, the two black cards should have been given, in my opinion, to Stephen McManaman. And then the other one, I think it should have been given to Jason McGee when he took down Connor Glass. Now, a lot of people said, oh, look, it was a tangle. Reality is, he stopped Connor Glass going through on goal. And how many people can make it look like an accident? I'll just fall into him. I didn't mean it. That's, a, that's what the black card was brought in for. McGee should have walked. Mm -hmm. And then so should McManaman. So... That was looked like it was pretty hard done by Derry. Stayed strong. They got the equaliser. And then Connor Glass had that shot at the end, which went wide. And you, the way it was played out, Connor Glass is very much a face of this Derry team. It would have been fitting that he would have got the winner. It goes wide and goes into extra time. And I was thinking, oh, Donegal might have a bit more experience here. This might be where Donegal kick on. But Derry's fitness in extra time was just fantastic. Brendan Rogers was up and down the pitch. He was fantastic. And he seemed to he seemed to outgraph Michael Murphy. Whereas, you know, usually it's the other way around. Murphy usually wins the battles, but an extra time, Brendan Rogers with that point to put Derry back in front towards the end. Fantastic, real inspiration. And he's been fantastic for Derry, a fullback. He's been there for years. Their defense was fantastic. Chrissy McCaig had Paddy McBerty in his pocket all day. Connor Doherty did a fantastic job on Ryan McHugh in the first half and then on Pader Mogan in the second half. Like Derry's defense is supreme. And with McKinless there as the spare man back, they have one of the best in the country at it. Yeah, I mean, you mentioned Brandon Rogers there. Like, his performance was exceptional, like, kicking three points. Probably one of the standout performances of the of the entire championship, really. I suppose maybe because a lot of the other games have been heavily one-sided. But, I mean, m most definitely, like, Rogers' performance was was exceptional, really. And especially in there, a fullback. Like, he, he's even putting himself... It's early days, yeah, but he's even... Put himself strongly in the position potentially for footballer of the year. I don't think Connor Glass is a million miles away as well. Like interesting about Connor Glass, like he comes back from AFL, wins Watty Graham's Glen, their their first ever Derry Senior Football Championship, and now wins Derry their first Ulster title in 24 years. Like it's it's incredible what can happen, and obviously it's not just down to him. Like there's a lot more that goes into it, but it's incredible just like what one player can do to just give a boost a whole boost to a county really like and it wouldn't even surprise me if Callum Brown's watching over in uh in, in Australia and thinking I, I might come back you know I, I I I wouldn't mind being a part of that yeah and Anton Tohill as well is another one that I'd love to see him back in obviously the son of probably the best footballer that Derry have ever produced and another man who was over in the AFL he's what he's six foot five six foot six like he's an absolute tank of a man so getting those two lads back in would really give Derry football another injection um i i can't wait to see them have a have a go because obviously you've got you know dublin and Kerry are on the same side of the draw now like they could be set to face each other in a semi-final 
So Derry could face like a Connacht. That's presuming they get through to whoever they get in the quarterfinal. But they could get the Connacht champions or whoever beats them in the semi final. So yeah. Derry could be in a situation where they could almost tiptoe through to the final. And then it's just a once off game. And we saw Kerry struggle in the past against very, very solid defensive sides. We saw them struggle against Donegal in 2012. I know it was a very different team, but we saw them struggle against Tyrone last year in, uh, in 2021. And as well as that, Derry do have scoring defenders. You're talking about Tyrone last year. Everyone in the full back line for Tyrone scored in the first half last year because they had runners from deep and the Kerry forwards weren't tracking them. And as well as that, Derry hit, no, sorry, Tyrone hit Kerry for three goals. Derry have hit sides for goals throughout the championship, particularly against Monaghan. Like, there is a blueprint there that in, in some worlds, because as well as this, Kerry aren't not going to get a really competitive game. Say they don't get, you know, a, a tough quarter final. The Dublin game will be the only competitive game that they will have had since the league. So mm. there could be a sit. There's a like obviously you'd still say Kerry, but Derry will give them a right game if they get them. In my opinion, yeah, it's, it's going to be interesting. I mean, the Crow Park factor is definitely going to be interesting. An All Ireland quarter final is going to be is going to be intriguing indeed. And uh, as Sir Klopp says here, Derry will avoid. Ulster teams in the quarterfinal bar Matt due to the no rematch rules. So um yeah, I seen Cahar O'Kane was cheap or was was tweeting about that earlier. So obviously that must be a new rule that's come in there, which is actually good to see, to be fair, because how many times down the years, like I think I've seen it before. I think Kerry and Limerick ended up playing each other in a Munster final and then an all out in quarter final a couple of weeks later. So I think that's probably a, a good thing to be fair. But yeah, like I don't think Derry would fear anyone in, in the All Ireland Court finals. Like even if it was a Mayo um or a or a Mo well, obviously they can't play Monaghan, but Mayo would be the toughest team, I suppose, they could play in an all Ireland quarter final, maybe a Caldera or something like that. But I don't think they'd fear them really, to be honest. Like, I, I think they'd go in confident. Yeah, definitely. Because they know as well that look, they've got nothing to lose as well. They've already exceeded expectations for this summer i mean everyone knew Derry were good but still like you would have been a brave man to say at the start that Derry are 100 going to win the ulster championship i mean it's it's usually that case every season it seems to be a new winner every year but they've exceeded expectations for how good they've been they've proved that they are one of the best teams in the country so soon after being among the worst teams in the country down in Division 4. Their turnaround has been sensational. They've got nothing to lose. If they play against Mayo, Mayo have already lost to Galway. They have took a whipping in the league final off Kerry. The fans are on Mayo's back a bit, and it will be more pressure to win rather than reward if they do win, uh, if you get me. Mm -hmm. um, so I feel like Derry, like at this stage, they're like, look, we've already won the Ulster Championship. We don't have our full team. As you mentioned, the likes of Callum Brown and Anton Toho could come back. They're in bonus territory now. And a team that has nothing to lose is a dangerous team to play against. Yeah, it really is. Absolutely. And and the thing about this Derry side as well is they, they don't really... I know obviously they got beat by Galway in that um, in that league game, but they haven't been beaten too much in the, in the last couple of years. And that's, you know, that's a good habit most certainly to be in. Sir Klopp says as well, Donegal... Very similar to Galway and Monaghan. All of them struggle to to kill off big games. It's a good point. And Emmett says here, Dublin v Kerry, the championship decider at uh, whatever stage. And it is definitely looking like Dublin and Kerry are, are, are certainly one and two. And I suppose we'll we'll chat about the Dublin game first of all before we, we run through the other two provincial finals. It was Dublin 5-17, Kildare 1-15. As I was telling you off air, I watched the first half and... Really, it was it was good as over from there. I mean, five goals in in twenty five minutes. Dublin just absolutely destroying Kildare from start to finish. And I suppose from a Kildare perspective, very disappointing. But from a Dublin perspective, I mean, Dublin have been looking very very good. I know it's maybe the quality of opposition isn't there as what maybe some of the Connacht teams and the Ulster teams are facing. But look, you can only beat what's in front of you. And Dublin have handled their have navigated their way through the Leinster Championship very very efficiently. Oh, 100 percent This this is probably one of the most ruthless Leinster campaigns I think I've seen Dublin go on, if not the most ruthless. I think 2013, Jim Gavin's first year, I think that could be right up there. I mean, I know I remember they put 122 on Westmead in the Leinster final. But 
I think look, they've played like they've played like they've been insulted, Dublin, throughout the entire like do you forget how good we are type thing? Like they have buried everyone. The Wexford was just target practice. Mead was a execution from the start, and this was like a lambs to the slaughter. Kildare played so naive, and like I'll mention after, but Dublin, first of all, just so good. I mean, Con O'Callaghan back in, in the full forward line is just the focal point that we just lacked so much. I mean, right from the start, Mick O'Grady just couldn't handle him. Cormac Costello was on fire. Kieran Kilkenny was really, really good as well. Sean Bugler, Lee Gannon attacking from deep. We just look so solid. Brian Fenton in midfield as well, back to his best. Because whatever you're talking about, the quality of opposition, Brian Fenton's playing against Kevin Feely, who is one of the best midfielders in the country. And Fenton looked fantastic. He lorded it in midfield again. So, and yeah, you're right. Right from the start, Dublin just absolutely put Kildare to the sword. And the game was over after 25 minutes. Those five goals go in, which is disappointing because I was, I was really looking forward to a, a barn burner of a Leinster final. But it seemed like Kildare fully believed the hype. It seemed like Kildare fully thought, look, we've beaten them in the league in Newbridge. We're going to beat them in the Leinster final in Croke Park. It looked like they didn't take into consideration at all that how much bigger the pitch is. And you know, oh, going one-to-one -one on Conor Callaghan. Let's put one defender on Conor Callaghan inside the small square. Like, what is this? Like, the, mm. the marking, particularly for John Small's goal, I don't know if you've seen that back. John Small literally just ghosts in. There's no one near him. Absolutely no one near him. It was the type of stuff that junior B defences would be disappointed in. So, look, they were naive, but Dublin were fantastic and ruthless. Yeah, no, like, and to be honest with you as well, even in the second half, like, I feel like if Dublin wanted to, if they wanted to turn it up an extra 10, 15%, they probably could have ended up scoring seven or eight goals, to be perfectly honest. But at that stage in the second half, the game was over. There was no point, you know, putting their foot on the gas and trying to, to win by, you know, or, or trying to get more goals, really. But yeah, like what you said, like, I mean, the shift in play from Dublin this year as well, like in the league, it was very lethargic. I felt it was just very, like, just you know, playing a running game, just passing it around, sidewards, lateral hand passes. There was no real emphasis on kick passing into the full forward line or playing direct football. But watching them now, it's a complete role reversal. And, like, there's so many similarities watching this Dublin team. It does remind me quite a lot of Jim Gavin 2013, you know, 20. I know they didn't win the All-Ireland in 2014, but that's similar type of style. Now, Dublin did get caught out against Donegal, in 2014 so it'd be interesting if they come up against Derry it'd be interesting to see how that works out but I mean at the same time when you're watching them play this just real swashbuckling football like it's very entertaining and look it's great to see yeah and let's not forget that year if we're talking entertainment standpoint that Dublin team was really gun ho that year like it was we'll score more than you that type of we don't care how much we can see but we'll score more than you and that style led to one of the best games of Gaelic football I've ever seen that all Ireland semi-final between Dublin and Kerry in 2013 that was one of the best games I've ever seen and look Dublin were exposed at the back that day big time I mean James O'Donoghue took us to the cleaners he was fantastic that day and Colin Cooper at centre forward had the freedom of Croke Park in the first half but this team as well is similar enough to that in the sense that we're potentially loose at the back because, I mean, Kildare still did score 115. But on the flip side, like going forward, Dublin are just devastating. And as well as that, the, the goal threat is back. You're absolutely right. There was no goal threat in the league, really, from Dublin. They, they never looked like they would. I mean, uh, particularly against Kerry and Mayo, we didn't look like we were ever going to score a goal. Whereas this time... It looked like every attack we had, we were going to score a goal. I mean, the, particularly like Conor Callaghan in the second half, it was like he took mercy on Kildare. He went through and he looked like it was going to be another goal and he just put it over the bar. Dublin have their punch back. They have their they have their real goal threat back, which is something that we are lacking throughout the entire league. And let's be honest, throughout the entire championship last season as well. Yeah, it's interesting. Like Dublin scored more goals in 25 minutes than they had in 10 previous games from open play. Like that really does go to show just uh, just just how attacking they were and how rootless they were in the first half. But you mentioned there about Desi Farrell and or or even about Jim Gavin and back in 2013 and 2014, where Dublin sort of had this mentality of when they were like, you know what, we're just going to outscore teams. We don't care how much we concede. Like, do you reckon Dublin are almost doing a bit of that? 
this year because they're, they're like they, they have been defensive issues. They, I know they defended quite well against Kildare now, to be fair to them, to give them credit. I thought Lee Gannon, as you said, had a very good game. Mick Fitzsimons was good as well. But I mean, in terms of Dublin in general, like when you've seen them against me, there was a few defensive issues there. 11 goals conceded throughout the league. Like, are they going in maybe with the approach that we we have the forwards, our midfielders can score as well, we can push on Merchant up, he can contribute with a few points. Like, are they maybe just having the approach to, to just outscore teams and, and maybe that might be how they, they win the All-Ireland this year? Potentially. Potentially because... I mean, it worked in 2013. They won the All-Ireland that year. I mean, Donegal did catch us on the hop in 2014. And then that caused Jim Gavin to kind of, you know, completely redesign the defence. And we had a footballer like Keane O'Sullivan who could sit in there as the sweeper. But we don't have the Keane O'Sullivan right now. We don't have someone who has the... But, like, that guy was a a once-in-a-generation player. And in my opinion, one of the most criminally underrated Gaelic footballers I've ever seen. The brain that man had for Gaelic football was fantastic. And he was the perfect man to sit in and just protect the Dublin defence. But we don't have a Keane O'Sullivan now. We don't have someone who can read the game like he can. But we do have six of the best forwards in the country. Like Costello, you know, Con O'Callaghan, Kieran Kilkenny, they'd walk into any team in the country. And the numbers that we've been putting up against the Kildare side that, yeah, maybe was a bit, you know, vulnerable at the back, but was still very competitive in every single one of their Division 1 games. I mean, they drew with Kerry on the opening day as well as beating Dublin. So Kildare had proved that they were able to mix it with a Division 1 side. So the fact that Dublin were able to put 5-17 past them, like, as you mentioned, Mm. they took their foot off the gas. So particularly going in against the Kerry side, which, you know, love to play attack and football as well. Like, what a spectacle that could be. It could be 2013-esque. Yeah, it could be. But at the same time, I, I, I do still think you'll see Dublin navigate a bit more defensively, I think, as the as, as the championship goes on. I don't think they'll be as naive because I do think they've learned... Well, hopefully they've learned anyway from 2014. And even there was a few close games as well. As you said, 2013, that Kerry game really could have went either way. But certainly from a neutral point of view and as a spectacle, you would hope you might end up getting something similar to, to 2013. That would be uh, that would be very interesting indeed. Emmett says here, Kildare have a have two leaky defence, have a two leaky defence and have been badly exposed in the championship. Conceded 215 versus Westmead and how many goals versus Dublin before 30 minutes soft underbelly and you know before the game i wouldn't have said so to be honest because i would have said i I think they've really improved this year like five points in in division one normally would be good enough to to keep you in the league and in most seasons very good home form yes they struggled a little bit against westmead but i thought maybe it was a bit of an off day they'd beaten loud the previous week by i think 22 points when a lot of people looked at loud as a as a team maybe to, to shock hill there but yeah, you know, it, it, it's going to be tough for Kildare to regroup now going into the qualifiers, like a huge hammering to take. And, you know, there's a couple of teams that maybe will be coming through the qualifiers next weekend that would really fancy a cracker Kildare because you'd have to imagine the, the confidence is going to be very low after that loss. Yeah, 100%, because what have they got left to play for? That's just one of the things that, like, they've been shown now they're not getting through that glass ceiling this year. I mean, Dublin showed that they are levels ahead of Kildare this year when it comes to championship football, especially at the business end. Kildare now going into the qualifier, like, yeah, you're right. A lot of teams are going to be fancying a crack at them because morale has to be low after that. I mean, you just got absolutely annihilated. Um, So, yeah, I think a lot of teams will be fancying a crack at them. Whether they can pull it back or not, who knows? I think this will show us just how good of a man manager Glenn Ryan is because now this is serious adversity. They played the league like they had nothing to lose because they did have nothing to lose. They got relegated and still everyone was saying, you know, good campaign from Kildare. Like, what other team can get away with that? But um, they had nothing to lose there. The championship, this was a, an ugly day out for them. Um, and going into the qualifiers, yeah, I, I do think... Uh, every team will be fancying a crack at them because they are one of the sides that are beatable for, you know, a Clare or for a team that, you know, aren't in the Talton Cup this year. But just before we move on, I think we have to talk about the the class of Glenn Ryan. I don't know if you heard about going into the Dublin dressing room and support and drum roll. Yeah, yeah, like that's top man. And you Mm. have to give credit to that. Yeah, no, 100%. Absolutely. Like, I mean, for... 
for him to go in and and do that really and obviously be be behind that campaign the support for a drum roll campaign like massive fair play to, to to glenn ryan and the and the Calair management team and and look you know as you were saying there you know going into going into the qualifiers like you would probably you know th- th- there's a chance they'll get a, a team in the in, in the quarterfinals that they'll feel that they can beat i mean i feel like if they were to get a claire or a meads they would probably fancy their chances i know claire would probably be happy too and either a cork or a loud but at the same time, it's going to be interesting. I think if they can regroup and get to a quarter final, I still think they'll look back at this year as a as a successful season because it is still a relatively young team. Like Dara Kirwan's only recently come into the side. Jimmy Hyland's relatively young as well. They do they have had a bit of underage success this year. So it's, I don't think it's the end of the world for Kildare. You know, you look at some you look at a county like Mead, who obviously won a minor all Ireland last year. But for me, they have a lot of work to do to bridge the gap. Kildare don't have as much. But um, but it is still a, a big task, nonetheless. Um, we'll move on to to Galway and Ross Common. So it was Galway two nineteen, Ross Common two sixteen. Um, Ross Common obviously pushed Galway a little bit towards the end of the game, I and mean, it was a very good game. I feel like this game maybe got sort of caught under the wraps of obviously what happened with Derry, obviously achieving such a huge huge success in the Ulster title. But for Galway, look, it's the first Connacht title since twenty eighteen. It's a big moment for. For Porrick Joyce, I feel like this could be maybe a bit of a coming of age of this Galway side because they're one of them teams, maybe in a similar fashion to Derry, that have threatened to break through in the last couple of seasons. They've been there, thereabouts, but finally now they have their moment. Yeah, and they they won this kind of title the hard way, right? beating Mayo and beating Roscommon. Like they absolutely earned it, and it was a Roscommon side. Let's not forget that beating them twice already this year and in very quick succession. Like they beat them in the league and then beat them in the league final, and that was within the space of two months ago. So, look, Galway would have been feeling the pressure if we can't let these guys beat us for a third time. For the rivalry and for everything between these two counties, they weren't going to let that happen. And right from the start, they were brilliant. Um, I mean, I was very impressed with Killian McDade at midfield, very impressed with Shane Walsh, very impressed with Damian Comer as well. He hit one point on the 52nd minute where he was literally running like a train at full pace and he managed to catch it and without breaking stride, kick it over the bar, which is so hard to do. So they were really on it and they wanted to win this game and they absolutely proved that you know they are right up there. Among the best teams in the country as well, in my opinion. The forwards that they have, Shane Walsh, Robert Finnerty look really, really good as well. Matthew Tierney's a really good young player. And if you're talking about you know, a journey that Galway have had. I mean, before COVID, Galway were being talked about up and down the country for the the type of football that they were playing and, and the momentum that they had. Then COVID ends, Sligo pull out of their Connacht Championship game. Galway lose to Mayo in that Connacht final. 2021 then is a bit of a write-off for them. They, they get knocked out. And this is the real first real run that Galway have been able to put together since COVID hit. So the fact that they've it's culminated in a Connacht Championship is massive for them, in my opinion. Yeah, it's a weird one. Like, and it's a strange one. Sometimes when you get relegated down to Division Two, it can actually can actually benefit you because you, you you'll get to try out more younger players. You'll get to try out different systems, build up a bit of confidence, build up wins. We've seen Donegal do that. I think in 2018, I think it was. And um, they went on to win an Ulster title that year, or sorry, 2019 actually, uh, and and they, obviously they had a, a great year, nearly reaching a, an All Ireland semi final. And and Galway now again, in, in similar fashion, obviously coming through uh, Division Two, you know, very, very very good season by themselves, and and have carried on the the momentum through the the Connacht Championship. Do you think Shane Walsh is the the best footballer in the in in the country at the minute? I mean, it was an extraordinary display, scoring one six. He was very good against Mayo as well. And you, you just see how much better Galway are as of a team when he's in it. Because let's not forget last year and in 2020, like Shane Walsh did have a lot of injury problems. And and maybe that was partly down to, to why Galway didn't find that breakthrough. Um, I think he's up there in the category of the best. I still would probably take David Clifford over him. But I think if you're to say one of the best, fo- he's definitely, in my opinion, one of the best footballers to watch. I mean, the way he can just... The way he can just dummy about five defenders out of the way. I mean, for his goal, yeah, for his goal on the 17th minute, that was just peak Shane Walsh. That was just the way he was able to sell not one, but two dummies in quick succession. And then the finish was brilliant. When he's on it, he's one of the best footballers to watch. And he doesn't have a weak foot. He's able to kick right and left. And you wouldn't be able to tell. Like, 
can you tell me is Shane Walsh right footed or left foot? Like we don't like with Clifford, his right foot is brilliant, but we know he's left footed. Like I genuinely don't know if Shane Walsh is right footed or left footed. Like I think he's right footed, but like he's effortless off both sides, and he is the absolute key for Galway. And you saw in the league final when he came on against Roscommon, he injected so much into them straight away, and. In my opinion, it's no coincidence that they've won the game against Ross Common that Shane Walsh was fit in to start. Um, he is that good. And in my opinion, I'd probably say he's top five footballers in the country right now. Yeah, absolutely. Gavin says here, Galway stronger side, but annoyed with the black card not being paused again. And Galway stalling time, but hope German Murta starts in the qualifier. It's an interesting point about German Murta. I mean, he scored 1-1, I think, a 1-1 or 1-2 against Galway in Crow Park, and he scored 1-1 yesterday um, against Galway. I mean, he's made a big, big impact every time he's come off the bench. You'd kind of wonder, it kind of nearly reminds me a bit of Kieran Kingston with Shane Kingston with, with Cork. Like, you've got a very, very good player there, but maybe is he better coming off the bench? I'm not sure. But um, for us, common going into the qualifiers, look, you know, because they finished the game quite strongly. They didn't wilt. Like, the, if there had been an extra five or ten minutes, they might have pulled it back. So I do think of all the teams maybe going into uh, the, the qualifiers, Russ Common is definitely one of the teams that don't think you want to play because they're, they're still a very, very good team, in my opinion. Oh, yeah, absolutely. One, one defeat doesn't make them a bad team. And they lost to a brilliant Galway side. They, you know, they were the only side in the four divisions to be unbeaten throughout the entire league campaign. They went up to Division 1 as champions of Division 2. They have proven time and time again that they are too good for Division 2. They just haven't been able to really stick in Division 1 since going up. But, yeah, they are right up there as a Division 1 side, in my opinion. They can absolutely beat any team, in my opinion, on any given day maybe a little bit below the likes of Kerry and Dublin, but I think anyone apart from Kerry and Dublin, Roscommon can beat. And so, yeah, neither Kerry nor Dublin are in the qualifiers. So, yeah, I think Roscommon can beat anyone that that's in that draw with them. And I would not be surprised at all if they come through the qualifiers with flying colours. Yeah, I mean, the record on Crow Park in, in the championship anyway isn't too good. So it'll be interesting to see, obviously, how they how they get on and and yeah obviously uh, I think a favourable draw will definitely be be what Ross Common are looking for at the same time as well because if they were to get let's say it's Rhone or an Armagh that would definitely be uh be very difficult for them I don't think they'd, they they'd fear Mayo though to be fair it was Kerry one twenty eight Limerick eight points I think a lot of people forgot this game happened and and probably a lot of people maybe want to forget that it happened or or maybe just just didn't want to know about it to be honest I mean it was just very very comprehensive from um from Kerry I mean Limerick you know showed some early signs but I don't know it's a hard it's a hard one to judge or, or to discuss this one because it is you know it's kind of funny like on Saturday you'd everything that's probably wrong with the provincial championships on Sunday you'd everything that's right about the provincial championships so like we we can't win and lose in the same weekend it, it seems very confusing but like ultimately what's your I mean what what, what were your thoughts on on this game <laughs> he just said everything there like yeah. yeah i mean it's just a non-event how is this a final like kerry were without david clifford and still hit 128 i mean it's absolutely crazy um the fact that i mean i think what shows it best is the highlights the highlights of the game every single play you know you'd look up at the scoreboard every single time they'd show a highlight and kerry would have jumped up five points six points every time that the the mm. next point would be shown they were just kicking them over for fun. Tony Bros and Paul Ganey, it was just target practice for them. And the fact that Limerick probably, let's be real, knew that they were going to get beaten before they even stepped onto the field. Um, they do have some quality footballers, Limerick. I mean, all you have to do is look at the free from Josh Ryan pretty much out on the sideline. And then mm -hmm. Ian Corber pretty much taking on the entire Kerry team to kick a point at the end. But they, they went 18 minutes without scoring a point, Limerick. Um, and for that 18 minutes, Kerry just butchered them. So, like, it was tough to watch. It really, really was. It was it was watching a side that have made such strides, made had such momentum behind them, just know that they were going to get ripped to shreds and then get ripped to shreds. It was, yeah, you're right. Everything that's wrong with the provincial championships, it's what we've been seeing in Leinster for the last 10 years. 
um, with Dublin that won 17 of the last 18 Leinster titles. Like, how is that a competition? Like, I <laughs> get that point. Like, I said this all the time. It's basically like expecting Manchester City to to not win in a group with like Crawley Town, Leighton Orient. <laughs> like, of course yeah, they're going yeah. to win. Of course they're going to win. This is a a huge, huge county in Kerry in terms of po- in not not population, but the popularity of the sport. Every young lad in Kerry is going to be playing football. Like every young lad in Kerry is going to be playing football. Uh, the tradition and then the quality. Uh, and the funding that Kerry will get as a result of, you know, the amount of interest that is in it. Limerick are building, but they're up against, you know, the interest in the hurling and the racing and the rugby and everything like that. Whereas in Kerry, Gaelic football is king. Um, and yeah, it was just everyone knew what was going to happen. I mean, the goal for Kerry was a lovely goal. Killian Spillane, lovely finish, but very similar to the Kildare Dublin game. Like there was absolutely no one within the same 10 meters as Killian Spillane. He had all the time in the world to turn around, pick a spot and place a home. So look, Kerry, you can't really learn anything from them about this game. Apart from, I mean, Colin Cooper pointed out that they weren't converting goals, but I wouldn't be too worried about that because when David Clifford comes back, like he'll, he'll score them goal chances. So I haven't really learned anything about them here, apart from once again, as you said, showing everything that's wrong with the provincial championships. Yeah, Rory says here, Kerry could get beat in the championship again like last year when they weren't getting tested. And I suppose that's a good point, isn't it? I mean, not not getting these significant tests for, for, for Kerry. I mean, look, I think they did play very well to give them the credit. I mean, to score 128, very impressive. They're, they're navigating their way through games very well. And yes, they aren't playing, you know, top quality opposition. They probably had the weakest um, opposition, to be honest, out of any of the provincial winners. You know, and they haven't given away any goal chances, but... It's it's an interesting one with Kerry, isn't it? I mean, they they really are relying on challenge games either. Like I seen Clifford got injured in a challenge game against Ross Common, which probably tells me that he was almost probably going hell for letter really in that challenge game with the fact that I mean, you're not gonna get a test anywhere else up until an all Ireland quarter final. And I think there's a, a three to four week gap now until the all Ireland quarter finals. And we've seen Kerry before, like when they got caught against Tyrone. So that could be like that really is a worry. Like they're gonna need challenge games to get them up to speed with uh with an all out quarter final yeah and they have a history of being caught coming out on Munster. i mean 2010 they got caught by down 2012 they got caught by donegal like they have a history of being caught when they come out of the Munster championship cold and then obviously the most recent one is is getting caught in 2021 by by tyrone because they hadn't had a team charge at their defense like tyrone did and when they did it went through like a knife through butter so that's what a lot of people are talking about. Are Jason Foley and Tyg Morley going to be able to stop the, def- the the teams running at them this year? Because interestingly enough, Kerry could get Tyrone in the quarterfinal this year. Like the, the draw could be there that they could get them. And look, if they do, I think it would be very interesting to see if they are able to kind of improve on last year's form. Because last year at the back, they were so vulnerable. And look, Jason Foley was fantastic throughout the league. But now he hasn't really got a test since the league. And look, it'd be interesting to see that, like, we know, we're talking about Dublin's form there, hitting five goals in 25 minutes. Like, look, Kerry will have, have to be a million times tighter at the back this year than they were last year. Because if, if this Dublin forward line that's racking in them goals gets at the Kerry defence last year, it could be an absolute execution. And believe me, Dublin won't take their foot off the gas if they get Kerry like that. 100%. Yeah, it was Carlo 112, Tipperary 110. I mean, what result this is, like, a, I suppose, maybe one of the stories of the of the weekend in many ways, because it's kind of funny, like, when I was previewing these games uh, last week or, or, or uh, during the week, I was looking at this one and thinking, this is probably going to be the most one-sided of all the Talshian Cup games, like this should be very comfortable. Like if you if you want to, if there's a bet of the weekend, put your money on Tipperary. And long and behold, Carlo, who've you know really struggled this year, really really struggled. They've struggled over the last couple of years with you know players you know not committing to the county, obviously, and and just obviously a lot of changes there, limited resources. But what a huge huge win for for Carlo, one twelve to one ten. I mean, a, a famous win in many ways. Yeah. Absolutely fantastic win for Carlo. I, I didn't see this coming. Absolutely did not see this coming, especially after the goal by Martin Keogh pretty much straight away. 
Like it, it looked ominous for Carlo right from the gate. Tipperary had a goal in, and Tipperary had beaten Carlo by eleven points back in March. So when mm -hmm. they got the when they got the early run on them, I was thinking this is this could be pretty ugly here. Tipperary have some great footballers. I mean, even with all the players that have left, they still had the likes of Jack Kennedy and Connell Kennedy on the pitch. And then obviously Lee McGrath to come in off the bench, the, the minor captain who won in 2011. So I was thinking, look, Tip still have a lot of talent in this side and, and Carlo won't be able to to put up with them. And especially, I mean, finishing second bottom of Division 4, I didn't see where the momentum and the belief was going to come from. So you have to give massive credit to Niall Carew. And mm -hmm. yeah, fantastic day for Carlo. I definitely did not see this result coming. And uh, yeah, Bit of momentum behind them again, Cal Horizon. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, they're they're rising again. I mean, the the re rise maybe they should uh, they should call it. And um, you know, fair play to them, like for for getting that win. I mean, I was kind of hoping they get New York in the next round, just because you know you want one of them to to get to the next round, one of them to get to a, a semi final. Like what a story that would be. But they are going to be playing Westmead, who beat Leash one thirteen to thirteen points. And uh, look, maybe a bit closer than people expected. I think maybe people expected Westmead to, to really pull away and run away with this one. But fair play to Leash. Like, they did give a good test. They gave a good go after what's been a, a difficult year for the Leash men. But Westmead, I suppose, showing that steel to, to come through and, and navigate a three-point victory. Yeah, and like throughout Jack Cooney's reign, Westmead have just been a really solid team. They've They've always, in my opinion, I feel like they've always beaten who they should beat. And then they give a game to the teams that are a bit better than them, like the Kildares. They'll always give a good game to Kildare. They're not on Kildare's level in terms of beating them. But I haven't seen really Westmead lose a game where I'm thinking, my God, they should not be losing to that side. They seem to just, they're a real like solid lower division two, division three team since Jack Cooney's come in. And yeah, they did this job. Leash did put it up to them. But Westmead, I mean, Westmead did miss a penalty as well. Danny Bolger saved it from John Heslin. But, yeah, I, I'm not surprised Westmead have won. A little bit surprised at how close it was because, obviously, this is a Leash side that had just conceded five goals against uh, Wicklow. But, no, um, not surprised to see Westmead go through. And I actually think that they are real contenders for the Tolson Cup itself. Yeah, and another side that progressed there as well was Offaly, who won 18 points to 10. Um, now, what we're going to do is we're going to leave you to talk about this game because I have someone outside here with a delivery very quickly. They, they've arrived. They've arrived a little bit early, so we're going to try and uh, we're going to try and manage this in the in the best way that we can. So we'll we'll leave you to discuss this game for a couple of seconds, and then I'll, I'll, be, I'll be back. Right. So we'll just be just be thirty seconds. <laughs> All right. So what's up, guys? Shay here. I've I've uh, taken over Aaron's channel while he's getting the delivery, but uh, yeah, he's left me with this Offley versus Wicklow game. So big results for Offaly, of course, eight point victory. Um, definitely, you know, some standout players: Bill Carroll, Niall McNamee, turning back the clock as well. He just continues to age like a fine wine. And um, some lovely scores by Offaly. They weren't really tested too much though by Wicklow. In all fairness, Wicklow never really seemed to kind of get the run on Offaly in this game. Offaly, as I mentioned, Bill Carroll's points, Niall McNamee's point were the standouts of the game. And yeah, cruising to a pretty easy victory. I mean, Paddy Dunnick had made a great save in the second half from a Wicklow forward, which that could have given the Garden County a bit of momentum. But look, um, most people would have predicted Offaly and Offaly indeed go through. Me and Aaron forgot to mention in the Carlo Tipperary game, the six point swing where Connell Kennedy hit the post. It went down the other end and Niall Hickey scored the goal off Dara Foley's tap down to him, which ended up in a goal for Carlo, of course. That was a six-point swing, which definitely decided that game. And uh, yeah, I can't believe we forgot to mention it there. But yeah, victory for Offaly. Uh, Eight-point win over the Garden County in Wicklow. Um, yeah, I believe Aaron is coming back. I could hear him. There we go. There we go. Yeah, much, uh, much appreciated there anyway. Definitely didn't... Uh... That's what happens when you order a delivery, a delivery, and it comes after twenty minutes. Jesus, it was. It did say an hour, but um, but yeah, I'm out of breath now. Jesus, need to need to get back fit. But anyway, <laughs> so I go three fifteen, London two sixteen. I mean, I mean, this was one of the games of the weekend, really. I mean, wasn't it? I mean, what a what a what a result for Sligo. Like to put up a scoreline of three fifteen against London two sixteen went to extra time as well. An incredible game, really. 
Yeah, and there were definitely some some points in this that uh, that London definitely shot themselves in the foot. I mean, the two black cards toward, towards the end of the game, the two red cards in extra time, and then Sligo still stumble over the line by two points. I mean, throughout the game, Alan Riley was their key man. Some absolutely breathtaking points from him. The goals, of course, Pat Hughes palmed in a goal. Um, but London just kept fighting back. They got the great start. James Gallagher got on the score sheet with a goal pretty quickly, uh, set up by Stephen Dornan, who, of course, set up the other goal as well for, I couldn't make out his name. I think it was Aiden Halls or something like that. But it's, mm-hmm. he scored the second goal for London. And um, yeah, so he had a hand in a lot of good stuff from London. They kept pulling Sligo back. And I think if, if their discipline had been better, they might actually have won this game because they were right up there. And you could argue maybe Sligo's experience in terms of championship kind of came to the fore and they get the victory. Yeah, hundred percent. And I think for for London overall, I mean, you have to you have to commend them really for for their championship performances this year, and obviously their their, their league performance as well. And and certainly they'll take a, a lot of confidence from how this year has gone. You'd long for twelve points for Mana, won twelve, and for Mana. Just about navigating a, a tricky game against Longford in the end. Sean Quigley coming up trumps once again for the for the Fermanagh men and a, a huge away win to Longford. Yeah, and uh, and Alton Kelm is on a big a big shout out for him scoring that last minute goal to uh, to really see Fermanagh home. I mean, back from all the injuries that he's had, Ryan Jones as well kicked a sensational point from forty five meters out to uh, to really set them on their way. They hit Longford with a late burst. It had been a very even game throughout, but that little bit of class at the end from Quigley, from Moulton Kelm and from Ryan Jones, that that just kind of saw from Anna over the line. And speaking about the, the performance against Tyrone was really, really good in the first half. And, you know, they've shown that they can really grind out victories. For Manna, in my opinion, are absolutely dark horses to win the Talton Cup. They've been excellent in in previous championships of the last few years. Remember, they got to an Ulster final with Rory Gallagher as their manager not too long ago. And Ulton Kelm coming back into the side and being fit is massive for them because he's a fantastic footballer. And look, if Sean Quigley fires, I absolutely think that they could take anyone in this Talchin Cup on any given day. Yeah, absolutely. I'd have to agree with you as well. Like, I think for Mana, you know, like you've seen the quality of the teams and in, in the Joneses in there, Sean Quigley as well, Darren McGurn, good young player coming through. And do you know, I actually think they'll be quite happy to get Cavan in the next round at home rather than playing them in a semi final in, in Crow Park or potentially a final. Like I think they'll be they'll be fancying their chances a little bit at home against the against Cavan. Like let's not forget they beat Cavan last year as well. So I mean, for Mana, like if they could if they could see off Cavan in the next round, then suddenly it opens up a bit for them then. Yeah, because Cavan are right up there as, you know, the obvious best team. I mean, I'm sure we're, we're going to talk about the, the absolute trashing of down. But the, the way Cavan put away Antrim and the way that they hung in there with Donegal for so, so long, proving, in my opinion, that 2020 wasn't really that as much of a fluke as we might have thought at the time. But they showed that they they can compete with a Division One side, Cavan. And we always knew that they had the players. They've got multiple All-Stars. So on paper, you have to look at Cavan as being the favourites now to go and, and win the Talchin Cup. But I think if they're ever going to lose from here to the final, I think it absolutely would be for Mana, you know, in, in this game. Because, you know, going away, that's going to be a tough place to go now in, in Brewster Park. It will be it will be a tough, tough venue. For Mana will make it a real tough, hard kind of low scoring game and then they've got the likes of Sean Quigley up front that can pick points off yeah I think it'd be very interesting because obviously you did say they beat them in the league last year look it was a different from Anna side Ryan McMenamin was in charge they still had the likes of you know Owen Donnelly back then who they don't have now um but look absolutely from Anna can take any given team on any given day and I absolutely include Cavan with that. That that's the game to watch out for, in my opinion, because I think the winner of the Talisman Cup could come from that game. Yeah, and Royce McManaman was actually part of the Cavan setup now as well. So there's a real there's a real built in storyline for that game in many ways. And as you said, there it was very comprehensive from Cavan. Cavan twenty four points down, one twelve. I mean, didn't see any of the game, but when you look at a scoreline like that, when you look through match reports and all the rest, you get the feeling. Like having very much carrying on that same level of performance that we've seen them against Antrim, that we've seen them against Donegal. And 
disappointing from a down perspective i suppose it you know it, it's the ice on the cherry of what's been a, a very very miserable year for for down i think i've seen something like they've lost their last 10 games in in all competitions um which is incredible really but from a cavern perspective look i mean to, to put up a scoreline of 24 points paddy lynch has been incredible this year like they really are well and truly the the favorites of this uh of this Talchin cup oh yeah and down on the other hand just pitiful i mean i i saw your video there with, with johnny talking about the the comments that eugene brannigan made like everything around down football is so negative now and and, and everything about you know ryan mcavoy Craylon mooney all those lads leaving the panel i mean they only had nine lads starting in this game that started in the monaghan game like that's absolutely mm -hmm. crazy to think how how are the where are these lads going and no kill cool players like in what is going on <laughs> absolutely no cool cool players one of the best club sides that we have ever seen they've been in how many club finals now or at the latter stage year after year none of them are interested in playing for down and then they made a great start i mean down low hair got that goal straight away then Kevin responded by hitting the next six points without reply and yeah it was just a cakewalk from there for for them i mean the fact that down actually showed a hint of a bit of a a resistance but then Cavan just put them away with ease and look down have a lot to do if they want to get back up i mean as i said they should take some inspiration from what Derry have done this weekend because you know i mean Derry were in the mud there not too long ago and you know they've pulled themselves back down not too long ago we're in an all-ireland final so mm. look they can do it but it it's gonna take a lot of work yeah, I mean it's interesting, all right. And even when you mentioned this like earlier as well with, with with Derry, I mean Derry probably had a a similar problem in their county for a long time with club rivalries and uh, I suppose issues there. But I mean you have to say like a massive congratulations for for uh, well, well obviously for Derry for that victory, but for Down in particular, like it, it really just has gone from from bad to worse in the last uh, in the last couple of months. I suppose before we finish up. Where can people find the Play on GA podcast if they're looking? Obviously, that's your own show over there. So, where can people uh, check that out if they're looking for it? Yeah, so it's uh, it's just Play on GAA on uh, on YouTube, and we're on Instagram, and we're coming to Spotify very soon. Um, yeah, I'm uh, loving doing it. It's my first year. We just had our our one year anniversary there a week ago. We've been doing it exactly a year from a week ago. So, it, look, I look, I love talking about GAA. I love analyzing it i love the sport and the last year has been a pleasure doing it and uh yeah thanks a million for all the help aaron helping me get on and get some followers uh really appreciate it again yeah no but our top man much uh much appreciated and um yeah if anyone could go and check it out be much appreciated and um yeah if you could hit the like button for for this podcast as well hit the subscribe button all the rest be much appreciated and um yeah cheers Shay, for